But I wanted to go a little bit more into this why on some of the some of the oat things. Why we are as picky as some people think we are on grain quality. Okay. Remember, this is a dry mill, a dry physical process. We are not making ethanol. We are not making a slurry. We are not a hammer mill where we're taking that whole oat and just grinding it into flour. We are taking the oat, we're cleaning it through a system where we're taking the green oats, what we refer to as uh, green or raw oats. We're going through about 10 floors of cleaning apparatus, taking out the screenings, taking out corn and soy, straw, taking out the light oats. Now, a lot of you are questioning my theory about using a combine and picking up three pounds of test weight. Here's where we're losing a lot of that light oats, the thins. Those are the tertiaries, as we refer to it, because you know if you look at an oat flower, and you open up those glooms, that outside hull, there's generally two kernels in there, a primary, a secondary. The more uniform those are, the better. And then sometimes a tertiary. Some of the particularly early season oats, some of Fred Kolb's material, Fred will be here tomorrow to talk about some of the Illinois and Indiana lines like tack, spurs, and those have a preponderance towards a little more tertiary, okay? We get rid of those in that process here of the light oats through both density and air. We take out the seeds. We take out wheat and barley, which is really the tough ones to do. Uh, and understand, you know, there's, there's two reasons for it. One, the gluten-free, yeah, and that is a growing market, and we'll address that in just a little bit. Oats inherently are gluten-free, with the exception of cross-contamination with wheat and barley uh, that get into it. The other factor is, particularly with barley, barley has a much tougher hull on it than oats. Matter of fact, you can't de-hull barley without going through a process they call purling it, where you abrade it with like a sataki rice mill, where they have to abrade that hull off. If you have particularly a Midwestern barley variety, which are mostly six row varieties versus two row, those are a little bit smaller kernel. They malt very well. You know, Anheuser-Busch loved uh, six row varieties of barley for years and stuff because they malted really well and made Budweiser. But they also have a deeper crease. Well, if you have a barley kernel that gets into that oat mill, and it's by default the same size as an oat groat, and you go through the flaker, the steamer and the flaker, you wind up with a little barley in there, which number one, yes, is bad for the gluten-free status. Number two, you wind up with little pieces of hull. And if you ever have consumer complaints on sticks, or something sharp in your oatmeal, chances are it's not a stick, it's not a piece of straw, it's a little sliver of that barley hull. That's one of the biggest consumer complaints that Quakers had for years and years. Okay, then we dehull it. We take those clean oats, we run them through an impact dehuller system. We take the hulls off, the unhulled ones like, remember I mentioned a few of those varieties like Jerry, a high amount of returns that's not very efficient you know you're having to go back through the system and sometimes you can't still can't get the hull off or if you have to turn up your rotor speeds and your impact you wind up breaking that groat can you make a flake out of a broken groat not very easily okay then we go through after we dehull we have the raw groats we go through a density separator system and then you go to the only so-called chemistry involved in making oatmeal, and that's the kilning and sizing program. These are MEAG dryers, and there's many, generally about six chambers, 
And the reason we have to do that is as soon as you take the hull off that lemon, the palea, remember the tight hull, as soon as you take that off of an oat groat, the oat thinks it's time to germinate. So it starts an enzymatic activity, particularly peroxidase, tyrosinase, and other rancidity-causing enzyme changes. Big terms, but if you take the, oat, the hull off of a bin of oats and leave it for a week, you don't want to put it in your mouth. Okay, that's the easiest way. So as soon as we dehull those oats, we will steam them. We will go th through that MEAGS process, and it takes live steam, we call it, to deactivate those enzymes. Then we dry them and cool them, and we wind up with large groats, medium groats, and small groats. Then we cut them, and we will cut them either once or twice. And this is where the marketing gets kind of funny. Uh, the fines obviously wind up being ground into flour. The sized cut groats. Remember a few years ago, Oprah came out and talked about how wonderful these steam table oats, or I don't remember what she called them, the bigger. The same bloody groats. The only difference between a large round oat, an old fashioned oat, or an instant oat, is the thickness of the flake. Because what you're doing when you take an oat flake and make oat porridge or oatmeal is you're rehydrating that oat flake. If you rehydrate a big, plump half of a groat, it takes a little longer. That's the old-fashioned stirring or steam table, they call it. Is it any more flavor? Some people say yes. Some people say no. If you have an instant flake where you can just pour hot water on top of it, 90% of what gets sold there has got a flavoring, usually a sugar-based flavoring, you know, with a little cinnamon or, you know, honey or something else to it. Same oat. So is there a difference between an instant oat and an old-fashioned oat? No, not, not in the milling process. We flake them. <clears throat> we come up with the different sizes depending upon how many times we cut those groats. So to get to that, we have to um, go through the specifications. We base everything on a 38-pound test weight. Now, that's not a 38-pound bushel. Oats are 32 pounds in the U.S., 34 pounds in Canada, because they use an imperial bushel versus a Winchester bushel, which is very old-fashioned, you know, 1900, turn of the, that century, grain standards, okay? Basically meaningless, because if you buy oats out of Sweden or Finland or Norway, they actually talk about a bulk density, and they have dense oats. 13.5 is our purchasing moisture spec, but again, I really want to have oats at 13%, if at all possible. Maximum of 14 with discounts over 13.5. It's not a big discount, but it's much harder to get the hull off of a 13.5 than it is a 13% oat. The other factor is no two kernels are always the same in there. You're going to have grain that's 12% from the top of that panicle and stuff that's 14% or higher down below. That's where you get into your uniformity and consistency thing. That's why I like air on oats or stirators or, or whatever to keep air moving through that grain mass. 1% allowed wheat, 1% wild oats, 1% barley. None of these are problems here. Canola, same thing. 8% dehulled oats, maximum of 12. Now, here's the only inherent danger of cleaning the oats yourself, particularly with something as aggressive as a, you know, large combine. You got to be careful that you don't actually take too many of the hulls off in that process. Because if you get over like 12%, then the enzymatic activity starts. So we got to be a little careful with that. 12% small oats, and that's defined by USDA as thins, which is what goes through a 564 by 3 quarter inch slotted sieve. We will take them up to 20% with small discounts. Tenth of a percent heat damage, 2% foreign material, maximum of three, two, it should be two tenths of ergot, 
and then all of the other analysis. And of course, it's got to meet all USDA, EPA, FDA, CFIA guidelines. No live insects, okay? It's not so much that we can't clean out insects. We can clean out insects. We can clean out rodent excreta, you know, rat, whatever. What the problem is, is if you've got insects in there, chances are they've already laid eggs. That's where we get into a problem. The same thing with the rodents. If they've defecated in that grain, they've also urinated. Go stick your head in some of these old wooden granaries out here on some of these farms and take it with. Do you want that and the smell of your oatmeal in the morning? You know, I don't <laughs> think so. so. Okay, let's switch. Now we'll go into Jesse's portion. And forgive me for using her crib sheets, but I don't want to misquote her any more than I possibly can. By the way, if you haven't had the opportunity to meet Jessie, you really should. She's a wonderful, you know, raised in, on a farm, a uh, farm girl, married to a veterinarian up in Pipestone, Minnesota, and unfortunately had car trouble on the way down here. And when I went to pick her up this morning, she was standing there in tears because daycare also called and said her son was running a high fever. Could she please come and pick him up in Pipestone, Minnesota? And she said, no, I can't do that. You know, so she was hopefully calling grandparents to, to fill in. But uh, this is Jessie and her husband and their two kids. She's been with Grain Millers for over five years now, and she procures oats for the St. Ansgar Mill as well as flax, mustard, lentils, and chickpeas, uh, and some wheat and barley. And she also runs our sustainable grower program, which this year we've got about 60 farmers in, uh, all the way from Canada down through Marion, Indiana. and. Uh, it's, it's very similar to field to market, but we think it's a lot more user friendly in the small grains area and for the organic producer. And our two kids. The St. Ansgar Iowa Mill was purchased in 1992. Some, some of you from that area might remember up in St. Ansgar there was a uh, plant that started in the mid 80s that was a racehorse plant. It was called Noroats and Jim Mills started doing racehorse oats up there uh, because southeast Minnesota, northeast Iowa had pretty good quality oats, a lot of white oat varieties, which, you know, don't ask me why racehorse oats have to be white. The horses can't tell. You know, it's, I always say it's the horse's asses that can tell it more than anybody else. But <laughs> that mill burned down because, like a lot of mills, the grain dust is very explosive. That burned down. Jim got into the very small mill making oat groats for companies like Quaker and General Mills and others. You remember the 88 to 91, 92 was the oat bran craze when we discovered oat bran and how good it was for us. And we had all kinds of stupid claims out there about what it could do for you and what it couldn't, you know, including the benefits of, you know, eating um, green oats for your libido and all this kind of stuff, which. <laughs> doesn't work, by the way, just <laughs> want you to know that. But Grain Millers was a, uh, had a mill out in Eugene, Oregon, and there they merged with a company that was supplying them most of their oats called Agri-Trading out of Hutchinson, Minnesota. And they bought the mill in St. Ansgar, Iowa, uh, and greatly increased the thing to what it is today. Today we can mill as many oats in St. Ansgar as the big mill over it here at Cedar Rapids for, for Quaker. We uh, very state-of-the-art machinery, 152 employees. We do oats, cereal grain, specialty fibers. We mill oats, barley, hard red wheat, soft wheat, rye, and triticale. We do not have a brand out there on the shelf ourselves anymore. We did up until this last summer. We called it Country Choice. It was sold at Trader Joe's and a few other places. But we found out that we were competing particularly, and that was all organic. We found out we were competing with Nature's Path, uh, Northern Gold, Cliff Bar, Trader Joe's, other companies that we do all their oat products for already. So they gently suggested that we sell that brand to them, which they now do. So we don't have anything on the shelves ourselves. Also, the barley and the wheat and the triticale that we do 
we make mixes there. So for instance, Quaker's chewy granola bars are the oats are milled in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, but all the other ingredients that go into it are made at St. Ansgar. So we're basically a contract manufacturer. Uh, as such, we have a lot more flexibility. We also have uh, as tight a spec as anybody in the industry. So just we had a few questions about the market. The continued growth is in the cereal bars. Why? because we don't sit down and eat breakfast the way that we used to. You know, we eat on the go. We go drive through, you know, McDonald's or Starbucks or whatever, and we want something fast and convenient. And by the way, mom's probably got a job outside the home instead of sitting at home, you know, or she's on her way dropping the kids off for early morning practice or whatever. So both, well not both, but Kellogg's, Post, General Mills, all of them are competing fiercely in the ready-to-eat cereal market. Quaker, all of them. Um, the interest now in lower sugar content cereals, the obesity in schools, all of these are eating into the ready-to-eat cereal market quite hard. You know, the majority of Cheerios, as an example, and it's a wonderful product, nothing against it. My kids eat, eat it, I eat it, my grandkids eat it. There's more Cheerios consumed as a snack food than there is for breakfast anymore, just the way that we're consuming uh, the oat products. The conventional oat product, oatmeal, oat breads, only about a 1% year-on-year growth. Strong growth in the organic oat products. This year we're up over 12% again. And of course the buzzword out there today is gluten-free, you know. I kid you not, I live in Naperville, Illinois. I went south two weeks ago down to go down to the USDA Peoria Labs, and there's a steel factory down there right along I-55, and it said, now serving gluten-free steel. <laughs> I kid you not, you know. Somebody's got a good sense of humor there. You know. Oats inherently, like I said, are gluten-free. We do do a gluten-free product, but we're doing it with mostly organic oats, a lot of it with seed growers, where we know that we don't have the wheat and barley, and then we have a uh, very unique cleaning system uh, at our mill in York and Saskatchewan to do the product. So a lot of people that are claiming gluten-free now, we're actually doing the work for them. Uh, there's a quick, uh, there is a growth. Uh, Starbucks is a customer, Dunkin' Donuts, we're trying to work on McDonald's. But, you know, you don't walk into McDonald's and say, hey, would you like to do an oat muffin today? Uh, because if they're interested, they want 20 million pounds of it tomorrow. You know, that's, that's mass marketing for you. Stagnant growth in the giant food companies, it's not the end thing to the consumer. And we've got so many new brands out there. You know, it's absolutely amazing. I do get the opportunity to travel, uh, you know, worldwide. You go into a grocery store in China or Southeast Asia or Europe, and they have maybe 10% of the brands on a grocery shelf that we do. You know, generally a lot more grain-based material, a lot of it less sugar and stuff than, than what we've got here in the U.S. Um, our growth requires the addition of new milling capacity every two to three years. We've just expanded that mill capacity in St. Ansgar. And for those of you that have delivered to us and know the truck line weight we are building off to the southeast corner there, are some brand new concrete elevators this winter and next spring. Hopefully that'll be in place so that we can unload you faster. We're, not, we're still gonna have to take the time to do the grading, but we'll get you unloaded faster. And, and the projections, and again, Grain Millers is a privately held company uh, there's three families that basically own most of the stock in the company. Their projections out of the last board meeting was that our business is going to double in the next 10 years. And to do that, our plan is still to buy directly from the producer. Demand for organic food is hitting record levels. The global organic food market is projected to grow at 16% annually from 2015 to 2020. 57% of the people 
surveyed. This was by, a, uh, I think, Mentel out of Chicago did this, say that they would prefer to buy organic if given a choice. Probably 90% of them couldn't define organic if you asked them what it meant, but that's what they're saying. 84% of consumers do purchase some organic. That's amazing to me. Uh, but then again, I live in Yuppieville, Naperville, Illinois, and we have Whole Foods. We have uh, three brand new, mostly organic stores opened within about a 10 mile radius of my house in the last two years. Fruits and vegetables make up the majority, 43% year over year. Why is this occurring? Well, health concerns, increased awareness of health, improved standard of living. I had somebody tell me yesterday they thought it was Obamacare. This is damn tough to get insurance anymore. Government initiatives, <laughs> organic availability. So why would we build an oat mill in Iowa? <laughs> Not because everybody did. Yeah, you know, you go back to the chart that David had up there, 1950. Oats, Iowa was the largest oat production state in the nation. And that's why you had national oats, and you had Chelsea, and you had Quaker oats. And uh, Quaker had a mill in, in St. Joe, Missouri, as well as Cedar Rapids, Iowa. When I started with the company in 1975, we bought 90% of our oats within a 100-mile radius of Cedar Rapids or St. Joe, Missouri. By 1991, they were 100% Canadian oats. This is where mills are today. I don't know how well you can read that. It's a little blurry here. General Mills up in Minneapolis, La Crosse Milling at Cochrane, Wisconsin. Grain Millers at St. Ansgar. Richardson, which was the old can oat, um, well, it was actually ConAgra, is now owned by JRI or James Richardson International out of Canada. Uh, Quaker and Cedar Rapids. That's pretty much all of the oat milling capacity that's left here in the mid in the, in the U.S. Oats, and I, I alluded to it earlier. When we started buying more domestic oats this year, our millers were after me about my, you know, and these are the guys that are getting measured on efficiency. You know, their their performance reviews or how efficient were they doing on the on the mill. We know that oats, domestic oats, aren't going to mill as yell well as those 44-pound, you know, oats out of Canada or those cleaned oats out of Scandinavia. When we buy, or when we, when the industry buys oats coming out of Europe today, whether this is out of the United Kingdom, which basically is a, generally an importer, but Scandinavia, Finland, and Sweden, those oats are all cleaned on the farm. They're 99.5% pure oats of the same size because in Canada or because in Scandinavia the farmer would never think of selling raw grain off the farm without having it slightly conditioned that's just the inherent difference between those oats so is there going to be a little bit of a yield drag yes some of the other companies um, have terminals in Canada like Richardson General Mills the supply out of the US is highly variable um, the question came up about organic. No, we can't raise enough organic oats in the U.S. or Canada today. We've already imported two boatloads of organic oats out of Scandinavia this year, this crop year. So that's why the organic premiums are there the way they are. So pricing, and I'm going to get into a little bit of dangerous territory here again because this is actually Jesse's uh, presentation. But all prices on all commodities are obviously based off the Chicago Board of Trade. We add our basis. We take away trucking uh, for freight on board contracts. Example, in 2016, we had a basis of 15 over, which uh, over the Dece, which equated to a 206 a bushel, 20 cent trucking from this particular farm. So the price wound up at 201 a bushel picked up on that farm. Now the current bids for delivery to St. Ansgar, this is on conventional oats now. The, the spec that I had up there for May delivery would be 55 cents over the Chicago board, 65 for July, 
15 over the Dece for August, September, basically new crop, or 30 over the Dece for uh, OND. So the question that came up during break about does it pay me to store oats? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Certainly that if there's carry in the base or carry in the market, the basis says yes. Why? Because no oat miller can store a whole year's crop on their facility. Just not possible. We have to rely on the on the farmer to store those oats. So what are the current prices on other Conventional grains, Jesse's right now bidding uh, 450 on barley that's delivered St. Ansgar, 650 on rye, 580 uh, on wheat, both winter and spring wheat. Uh, she tries to buy about three months at a time, not very big volume because again, what we're doing is we're grinding this to make it into mixes for uh, some of the companies that we supply into the cereal bars and uh, mix category. Okay, cash price on organics, eh, it's, forget about the Board of Trade, okay? It has no bearing on this one. It's all cash. It's all on supply demand, prices that work for the customer. And it, it always intrigues me when, you know, I had very little to do with the organic market, particularly, until the fall of 2012. And one of the first things they wanted me to do was go talk to Kellogg's. Kashi is Kellogg's, and that's their organic group. And they really wanted to know about our sustainability program, which I had worked on with my previous em employer. So I went through the three pillars of sustainability, the economic, the social, the environmental, and what Grain Millers was attempting to do with farmers on recognizing all this. And they said, we love it. We think it's absolutely great. By the way, here's a request for a quote on price. You know, and you better come in at least 15 cents under what somebody else can. You know. So, yeah, they love the ideas of what we're doing quality-wise and sustainability-wise, but it's all what the end user, that manufacturer, is willing to pay. On organic oats, today we're at 675 for organic oats delivered, or 650 FOB aims, and that brings up the point that yes, we generally got trucks running all the time. Not our own, we don't own our own fleet, but we work with farm with uh, grain trucking companies that understand organic business and understand the certificates that are needed and the cleanliness that we require, and they're willing to put up with the grain testing that we have to do. You know, it's not like running to ADM and Cedar Rapids and, you know, getting dumped there regardless of what you got in the truck. You know, it does have to be oats. Organic barley, 1050. Organic rye, 1050. And organic hard red winter wheat, 1550. Those are the organic bids today. So, did I get a premium for high test weight? And this is a question Jesse wanted me to address, uh, even if she was here. Always the question of, you know, I get a 32 pound bushel, but damn it, you won't buy it if it's under 36. Well, it's still on a 32 pound bushel, okay? So, the way that the Europeans have got this figured out is, they don't pay on a bushel. They don't, they don't pay on a volumetric measurement. They measure on density on it, okay? If you take grain into a grain dealer in Stockholm, they're gonna use a packed cylinder and actually measure the density of the grain that they're selling. And that's why they want it as clean as they possibly can. So you are, in the fact, the higher the test weight, the more premium you are actually getting because we're still paying you on a 32 pound bushel. Is there a premium when it goes to food? Well, you know what? Maybe Sarah or somebody like that should address this one because we believe that there's typically a 10 to 25 cent a bushel over other local markets, you know, for food grade oats versus feed grade oats. But I've heard as much as a dollar spread this year and stuff on it, again, depending upon those attributes. Just be very, very careful. When you're selling your oats to the elevator, or to a feed mill, what's their intended purpose and how are they grading those oats? Because maybe aroma or odors or a little bit of weed seed doesn't mean a diddle squat other than that's just a grading standard that they've had from 40 years ago. You know, understand why discounts 
or bids that you're getting, what's that based upon? Um, and that's one of the reasons, again, why we're trying to deal directly with the farm. Feed oat price is very low in comparison to corn feed. Uh, it was better before DDGs came into existence. And today, um, during that brief period between Quaker and grain millers, I actually did some work with a gentleman by the name of Randy Stryker out of uh, British Columbia who was working for the Prairie Oat Growers Association on a study looking at the horse feed racehorse market and stuff on it. And the biggest single factor that killed the racehorse industry was not so much the decline in horse racing as it was DDGs, because every feed formulation company today uses DDGs as the filler, as the primary source on fibers and stuff now, instead of oats into swine rations and, and some of this. So, and of course, up until a very short time ago, there wasn't even a standard definition of what a DDG is. You know, it could be sand, but you know, as long as it came out of the milling process. Organic oats, um, the difference in the price spread there, and there is getting to be more and more interest in some of the organic oat feed market, and that's, uh, I haven't even addressed that one at all. But there's about, you know, a six seventy-five to $4 difference there. So a lot of times, if your oats that are organic are rejected, or we can't use them, we have a whole team of people that are gonna find a home for you on that at that higher market level because they're getting calls from particularly poultry people today that are very, very interested in it. Why are they not a bit higher? Well, ending stocks are an all-time high. Oat stocks in the U.S. and Canada included. Um, we had a good year last year on yields. And of course, oats, you know, the traditional conventional market follows corn and wheat off the board of trade. Most of the supply is from Canada. Uh, a year ago, you saw quite a spike right now in oat prices domestically. That was a basis driven, not the board of trade, because you couldn't get a rail car out of Canada, you know, if you went up there and pulled it down yourself, because the rail lines were, you know, they were blaming the weather in Canada. And the, the main problem was they were running so many oil trains south all the time that, honest to God, I heard of grain suppliers that I used to do business with having loaded cars setting 45 days, you know, on track, waiting to get moved. Couldn't find engines. So, Jessie's got some door prizes she wanted me to throw out. So where's our closest mill, closest grain miller's mill? Okay. <laughs> I'm, we could be in trouble here. St. Ansgar, what six grains do we mill? Oh, this one's going to get tougher. There you go. You said oats, so. Okay. The largest oat producer in the world. What country is the largest? And uh, give me, give me a hand. Some. Nope. Nope. Yeah, Russia. Russia produces more oats than all the rest of Europe combined. The problem is 90% of it never leaves the farm. And the uh, World Oat Meeting this year is in St. Petersburg in July. And I'm not sure I want to go because I don't think there's a note there that I want to see. Oh, and her son's name, which I didn't give you. We won't do that. That's Drake. And... Well, this is going to be real interesting because I did not do this. My favorite type of whiskey, whatever is bought for him. <laughs> I will take questions. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, DE in, in small grains. It's cleared, it's legal. 
I want you to use it effectively, but yes, we do buy oats that's been treated with DE. Again, understand that it's more of a preventative than it is an actual curative on it. So if you're gonna use DE, use it early in the season when you put it in with the oats. Uh, the same thing on for the conventional person, you know, malathion is not a fumigant. If you're gonna treat a bin floor or around the outside of a bin, uh, no residues. Uh, but since DE does not have a uh, chemical residue, it's safe to use and it's encouraged. Yes. We haven't, we're not far enough into that. To, no, you know, the, the gluten, we don't extract in gluten. The gluten-free, you know, gluten is a starch protein that's in wheat and barley. Oats doesn't have that same physical structure, chemical structure and stuff. So oats by itself does not have the gluten, that, you know, the glutanins basically that cause the problem. So there's not a specific variety, no. Boy, I bored him. Yeah, Jordan. I I wish I had the time to go into this with you. I'll, let me just suffice to say 90% of it is transportation and marketing. 90% of the cost. I, I did this with a previous employer, actually looking at the price of oats per pound between retail and what the producer was getting. And over 90% of the cost in manufacturing that finished product went into marketing and into logistics to get it there. Classic example, there was a product that a company wanted to do around the idea of locally sourced, locally grown. You know, that's a big, big thing out in California and the West Coast right now. They were willing to buy the oats in Canada, ship them to another mill where they were milling the oats, then shipping that product to St. Ansgar, Iowa, where we, we were gonna add triticale in five of those six grains, then send it to cloud packaging in Chicago, and then go to their distribution places out on the West Coast. And that to them was locally sourced. <laughs> it didn't go, it didn't work, but that's where your costs are at. I've got, Jesse was gonna go into this and can do it far better than I can, but some of the, the bars, you know, kind bars and stuff, which are supposedly more natural. Cliff bar, you know, go into a Casey's around here, whatever. Take a look at a cliff bar in comparison to a candy bar as far as cost. This is gonna cost you twice as much for a hockey puck, you know, basically. <laughs> But, you know, it's natural, it's organic. You know, could they pay, and these are all manufactured out on the West Coast in Oregon and stuff on it. What's the inherent cost in that? Because this hockey puck weighs a whole lot more than a candy bar does, so it costs more to ship it and the distance and transportation. Yes, sir. Oh, absolutely. Good, good point. I'm, 
It is. It is. But it points well taken. I'm uh, getting the hook over here. So I've obviously, you know, and I got this throat problem because if I don't leave, he's going to cut my throat. So I will, we're going to have a booth here tomorrow. I'll be at that booth all day. And uh, since I kind of blew Jesse's handouts and stuff, stop by and talk to me. I'll give you a treat. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.